And this is the title of his stock, please, Carol. Yes. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We all uh, live in a very unique times nowadays. On one side, uh, we are facing major crises, major problems uh, that have been seen already in history. Uh, distrust of uh, people to representative, uh, conflicts, uh, hatred among people. And all these factors of long-term unsustainable situation would need to lead some kind of uh, catalyst. In the past, it would be wars. But fortunately, on the other side of the spectrum, uh, we are in a completely unique situation where we have technologies, we have science, we have knowledge. Uh, we have the opportunities that have never existed in history. And I believe that now we are in the final stage of uh, evolution, in, uh, in some one step of evolution, which is an evolution of our minds. And I believe that we are approaching what I call social singularity, a point where we will need to decide. Either we fail, and here in this case the catharsis could be very bad, or on the positive side, we will be able to engage in a, a new chapter of evolution, which is a fair, transparent, and engaging society, where people cooperate and support each other and mainly respect each other across cultures. I call this Human Society 21. And uh, we would like to introduce you uh, some tools that we believe are uh, very useful and that uh, might increase the probability of success uh, to being very high, uh, to crossing even 96%. Let me please introduce to you Lilia, uh, my colleague, political analyst, who is a graduate of Oxford University in political science, and she will share uh, our talk and she will contribute to the talk as well. Hi, good afternoon. I come from an academic background. I have studied at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences and Oxford University. But for the past couple of years, I work for a foundation which works with the principles of gross national happiness from the Kingdom of Bhutan, bringing them to the Czech Republic. And what we try to do is we try to stimulate debate and ask the question, what do we really want as a society? What are the values that we want to build our lives, the lives of our children around? What is important? We know that economic growth alone does not suffice. And so when I came into contact, in fact, we invited Karel as one of our very honored speakers to our annual GNH conference two years ago. Um, when I met his concept of D21, Democracy 21, I was fascinated by the fact that they did not merely want to stimulate debate, but were able to offer practical tools for how to stimulate the process and how to not just answer the question of where are we heading as human society, but how to get there. So it is my great honor and pleasure to be here today and to contribute to this discussion. Let me uh, please introduce myself briefly. Uh, it is me on the picture. And uh, I, have, uh, I have been, uh, since my early childhood, I have always, I knew that I would be a mathematician since my five years. I wanted to be a mathematician with a very short uh, period of like half a year when I wanted to be a bricklayer. But it was only very temporary. And since my early childhood, I saw a great meaning of science and progress of human society. And I always wanted to be the scientist. And it did happen, uh, however, I also uh, managed to start a company which is called RSJ. And this company has become extremely successful. It is a market maker in uh, financial markets. It is the largest trader in London International uh, Euronext Life in London. And it belongs, uh, RSJ belongs one uh, between two or three largest traders on Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the success of RSJ has allowed me to divert my focus towards society, towards things that, that are very important and uh, that we should be responsible to take care of. And my first activity uh, in this sense uh, was uh, starting uh, the um, 
Oh, it's okay, so maybe you should go to the next one. Somehow it grayed out. Uh, starting the neuron, which is here is the second line. It is a foundation uh, for uh, support of research and science. Uh, this foundation I started uh, in 2009, 2010, and it has been, uh, it was originally a foundation for support of research and science. Now it's from neuron, uh, which has been very successful. And I am very proud of that. This is still not about what I'm, we are going to talk about, but what is more related to, to our topic is, uh, okay, the anti-corruption endowment, Nadashin from Proti Korupci. This happened in 2010, when I, as a naive uh, citizen of the Czech Republic, was very happy that uh, what I considered to be, to be a progressive uh, uh, party, a civil society party, won uh, over 50% uh, seats in Prague, and I was expecting progressive, rational behavior and economic progress. What happened is that after a few years, I found out that the, the guy who was a mayor and who I believe to be a very smart, rational guy who was a medical doctor, it turned out that the whole system was extremely corrupt. And I knew it and I, I could see what, what they did and how much they overcharged and overpriced uh, what was the fair value. And this made me really upset and because I like to do something with things that I can do, I was thinking what could I do? And uh, thanks to the uh, experience with uh, Foundation Neuron giving prizes to scientists, I realized that uh, we could do the same thing. That we could start giving prizes to whistleblowers, to people who dare to do something against corruption. And this is how started my quest against corruption in the Czech Republic, and it has been uh, very, uh, it has been successful. It has been, of course, very controversial. I've been sued and uh, things like that. But nevertheless, after like one year of existence of the anti-corruption Dowman, I realized another thing. The core of the problem for society is not the corruption. Corruption is a cancer which must be fought, otherwise we die. But uh, the reason why the cancer is there is because of those people who are elected, who are being chosen, who are our representatives, who should be our masters or our examples, and of, unfortunately they are in the wrong way. So I started to think about how to change that. And I was working on voting system and that's how all this process uh, came. All the other projects I have been involved in are, um, are um, uh, not, uh, I'm not going to speak about it now, but there are foundations and there are, there are all projects that are either uh, very good uh, high impact business or projects that are uh, supporting society, civil society, education and uh, activity of people. Okay. So there is uh, some technical issue, I apologize for that. Oh, okay. That was some. Okay, okay. So uh, the the top of my activities as of now has been uh, Democracy 21, the voting system Democracy 21, uh, which is based. The main uh, main importance of Democracy 21 are multiple votes, that each person can use multiple votes. And we will explain to you uh, why, uh, uh, what it means, what it gives us. And indeed, uh, it may be surprising, it may almost sound too good to be true, uh, but it is extremely powerful system and once implemented in politics, it will bring uh, global and uh, radical change. Let me first introduce just voting for probably you know it, but just very briefly. Uh, I uh, denote democracy like a, a software developer because in my life I also did some software developing. So version 1.0 of democracy is the first past the post system. United States, Great Britain, we all know that it is a very weak system and a very bad one, but still it has worked for hundreds of years. What we could Possi possibly consider a little bit better, but not too much. It's a proportional system, uh, like in the Czech Republic. 
The check proportional system is not very good, however, because it's a close and uh, party list and uh, people have very low influence. Uh, it is, promotes corruption, it is pro-corrupt and uh, it uh, leaves people with disgust. And of course, we can see decreasing voting participation, distrust of people to authorities, etc. What we could, what I consider and what is probably the uh, in some sense, uh, probably the best uh, voting system applied in practical politics is the single transfer vote, like in Ireland or some version in Australia. Uh, version, for, you can see version 1.7 and upgrade, but still this system is not very good and we can uh, later discuss why. Uh, given the information that uh, people need to provide, which means a rank of uh, their preferences. By D1.9, I denote a voting system that I created in, uh, in 2012. It was a voting system aimed against corruption. My approach was, corruption is here, it is here because of the people that we vote. How can we improve the quality of people we select? And I created the voting system which is, uh, which, whose important feature is a vote against. So you vote not only for, but you also vote against. So the voting system D1.9 in this case would be two seat voting districts, two, P, two plus votes and one vote against. This is still not the main thing. So we are at 1.9 and the next step is we are making an upgrade uh, upgrade from DOS to Windows, and we are coming to ver version 2 and actually up to all the way 2.1. And here is the, here's the major change that, that, is, uh, that is based on the effect of multiple votes. So I think what Kyle forgot to tell you is that he is in fact a mathematician by training, and so you can see all the numbers developing accordingly. Now, I'll bring you back to our home country, Czech Republic. We have one of the lowest voting turnouts in the EU. There are other countries which are quite close, places like Slovakia, Slovenia, Lithuania, which shows that people's trust, well, I mean, we don't have a consensus that the democratic system is probably the best of what we have at the moment. And we don't particularly want to go back to the earlier ones. However, if people are not turning out to vote, it shows us a simple thing. They don't particularly believe in the process anymore. So, what this particular new voting style is hoping to create at its core is better voting participation. A great solvent of some form of enthusiasm and belief in the democratic process by giving people an ability to vote in a way that would better reflect their preferences, in a way that would be less biased, in a way that would be harder to manipulate, and in a way that would allow for just a more direct and closer reflection of what people actually want. Now, of course, we have heard a wonderful presentation from Tanya just before us about all the challenges and specifics of when we use people's direct participation. However, I do feel that in which I believe Tanya was also saying that in order for people to believe in the democratic process, they must feel they have some form of a say. And so engaging them in a way where they feel that their say matters is absolutely um, primal if we want people to live in a democratic process. Now, this model is different for a number of reasons, and it's different because it allows both multiple votes and the negative votes. And this is a very simple, great example of what it does in practice. So if we were to use a single vote, right? And if we were to use a first pass the post system, and we would have people voting for six alternatives on this occasion, I believe this is a representative example of studies that have been conducted, but obviously a simple representative print just to illustrate the point. Now, people vote for their first preference. Whoever gets most preferences wins, right? So we can see that our last grid is currently at two and would be elected winner. However, the interesting thing is what happens if we start bringing in a more complicated voting system. Now, here, we're starting to give people the ability to choose their first and second preferences. And immediately, you see how the numbers begin to shift. And immediately, when we allow people to vote not just for the one preference, which only is voting for the lesser evil, something that we see in a variety of countries in the Western world at the moment, but when we allow them to choose their first preference in someone that they also don't mind, so to speak on the political spectrum, a number of things happen, and you can see immediately how the results shift. 
Now, of course, we can then also add what Carol was referring to a minute ago, which is the minus vote, the negative vote. So instead of voting for the lesser evil in the way that you vote for the lesser evil, you can actually specify who is the greatest evil, in your opinion, and take away your ability to win the election. So it is a tiny bit more complicated, perhaps, for the voter to understand. But you can see how it immediately maps out the preferences in a totally different way. Perhaps even more important than a simple shift in numbers is the shift in the kind of preferences that begin to emerge as the winner. So in a particular example that we modeled, if using the first past the post system, McDonald's happened to be the restaurant of choice. Now we will agree that that would not be the most socially beneficial. However, when we used the D21 model, all of a sudden the healthier and um, more socially, so to speak, uh, uh, favorable alternatives began to emerge as winners. And so far, our results from the statistics that are emerging are very similar. Because the moment our ability to influence the system is somewhat more varied than a single vote, which is a very difficult simplification of a wide grid of preferences, likes and dislikes, um, supports, and what we wish not to see in our politics then we can develop a much more consistent and interesting map and we begin to see what people actually want in a much more specific manner. And let me point out that uh, there is a software glitch in the presentation because we had their uh, restaurants, voting restaurants. So this example is giving a participatory budgeting voting, which we talked about. And here, here the options are different projects. And one of the projects uh, uh, is VIP parking, which would win, win under single transfer vote. But it's like uh, voting uh, for uh, only narrow group of people, which is not interesting in, for the wider audience, but the voting splits. So. Uh, uh, now, uh, let me explain to you uh, the previous example that is, uh, uh, that is uh, not very simple, but not an artificial example, but it's something that really happens in reality. And uh, let's all think about the traditional voting system. Extreme left, extreme right, democratic spectrum. So, of course, democratic spectrum competes. It's a big disadvantage. Uh, and uh, we can argue that the standard, if we say proportional voting system, is not fair. Why? Well, imagine, for example, that you have uh, two parties, each of them having 12% support, and um, one of them being generally acceptable, like a Green Party, for example, and the other one being very controversial, extremist party, being disliked by many, many other people. Uh, by being uh, described by more than 50% of other population. So is it fair, is it correct that both parties should have 12% representation? Under general conditions, probably not. And uh, D21, what does D21 do? Well, D21 offers you more votes than the seat, more votes than winners. So in the case of parliament, the proposal of the D21 voting system is two seat voting districts, and more votes, so four votes for each person. One vote per one candidate, of course. You cannot give more votes to one candidate. So four votes, one vote per one candidate. As an, as an option, we can use also the vote against, uh, minus vote. Now, let's think about now what happens. Uh, we have, uh, we have, um, yeah, um, we have an uh, extreme left voter, uh, let's say a communist voter. Uh, the voters give for two candidates of the communist party, would be an example of the Czech Republic. Um, they are two seat voting districts, so it doesn't make sense to have more than two candidates. And these voters are going to use two votes and are unlikely to use, uh, to use uh, uh, more, or if they use the addition to uh, two votes or one of them, they split it randomly across the uh, democratic political spectrum. Same logic applies on extreme right, if you wish. And also, very similar logic applies uh, to populist party. If you imagine, and a big problem of nowadays, that you have a party of a populist who manipulates a certain percentage of population, so these people go and vote for the representative or for the candidates of such a party. And yes, they might use their two votes for the two candidates. What will such a, such a person do with addition to votes? Again, either not use them or vote randomly through a political spectrum. 
But in general, we can argue that on the uh, negative side, uh, non-democratic side, uh, the power of people is too. And now we can see what happens with people who are, uh, uh, who are uh, demo conscious democratic voters, especially people who analyze situation and vote accordingly. So um, here we can see what happens is as if uh, we use the standard voting system but double the number of conscious democratic voters. Why? Well, because those people, they have four votes. They use two votes, perhaps for the candidates of their uh, favorite party, but they have additional two votes, which they use again. Imagine that you have uh, 21 candidates on the list, and you choose four people to the best of your preferences. So those people who are engaged, those people uh, who are knowledgeable, who give uh, energy and time to the, uh, to the democratic process, do actually have a uh, higher impact on result. So here we are solving this, uh, what would be apparent uh, contradiction paradox, is that uh, we are reaching a situation where people um, who are um, active and knowledgeable have higher impact on the uh, resulting process, on the democratic process, and at the same time, it is 100% uh, democracy, uniform voting right. Now, another effect of this, which actually has a big impact by poll. So there are countries where negative electoral campaigns are illegal or in some way limited. It's not the case of the Czech Republic. Our election campaigns tend to be pretty much completely negative. So the way you can pay for an election is you take your opponent and you try to disqualify them as much as you possibly can. Now, obviously, when everyone does that, it creates demoralization in everyone, by and large. Because there's always something that can be said about every political party. So then water, voter turnout is very low. I mean, unsurprisingly so, really. However, in a system where we expect that people will be using their two additional votes, yeah, having voted, having used the first two for their party of preference, now we have the two additional ones, they are most likely to use those votes for a party which is close on the spectrum, one would expect, rationally and logically. Now the impact that that may and will have on an election campaign is that parties that are close enough to will have much less incentive to go into negative campaigns and instead will try to find points of agreement and will try to, so to speak, get the second, the, the, the third and fourth, sort of the, the second class of votes from their nearest parties, which is probably going to create a lot of consensus, which is going to lead to parties to search for points on which they agree on, which is going to lead to a much more positive pre-electoral climate, which we believe very strongly can have a direct and positive impact on the way people will feel motivated to vote. Because if we can see parties that are close in range, being supportive of each other, being confirming of each other's agenda, we can create a more cohesive and hopefully a more successful policy-making process. And indeed, actually, what we can reach here is that political campaign, which is costly, may be actually a contribution to the progress of society. Well, this is exactly because, and, and let me explain this feature to you on a vote for presidential elections. That will be the easiest one. So we are voting for a president. Democracy 21 means that you have, everybody has two or even more votes. So imagine that you have two votes, you are voting for one president and there is a spectrum of candidates. So what will be irrational for a candidate of this process to do? The candidate will promote its, its strategy, promotes its vision, and also the candidate is likely to, to promote or to find good features of his or her opponents. This is very important. So imagine that we will have a democratic process when the campaigning will be such that uh, you as a candidate will be promoting good features of your opponent. Why would you do that? Well, you would do that because you want to engage, you want to attract the voters of your competition. You want to get their second or if there is more votes, other votes of, of the others. So, so what it means is that you will promote the other, and of course the other will see that and they will also promote to you. Of course it will be in a way, I like uh, these ideas of my opponent, but I want to do it even better because I'm offering this. The other candidate will do the same. So here we have a process of collaboration 
of natural collaboration, pre-voting collaboration, and in fact, a creative process. So we could be a witness in the future that voting, instead of being full of hatred, full of costs and inefficiencies, might be actually a time of a progress in society. Let me now uh, tell you some data. Uh, this has been uh, uh, D21 uh, I have developed in 2013, promoted since then. Um, and uh, the theoretical uh, results, uh, the, the, theoretical, uh, the logic is clear. But of course, uh, we want to verify by data, and we did. And in 2013, we did exit polls uh, for parliamentary voting in the Czech Republic with 2,500 respondents. A year later, we did uh, Senate and uh, voting and mayor's voting also with actually almost 9,000 uh, responders, exit polls, which has been the largest, uh, largest exit poll in the, in the history of Czech Republic. Now, I can share with you some data. Let me say that, of course, the theoretical, the logical, as, not assumptions, but the logical consequences that, uh, that we would expect, that did get confirmed, but uh, the situation got even better. And I myself was surprised very positively. Why? Here are some numbers. Um, many people would, uh, or would be uh, skeptical and would say, too complicated. People uh, will vote for their party only, nobody else. So not only that it wasn't true, but actually the opposite was almost true. Uh, out of all the respondents, there was practically no, no, no failures. And um, what happened, uh, actually, I would describe you how the, how the exit polls worked. So we have 11 uh, 11 areas uh, in the Czech Republic, big ones, where people would vote that each political party would have a closed uh, uh, party list of candidates, and people would vote for the party. What we did is that we took the first two candidates of each party, and on the exit poll offered people to choose to explain to them D21 and vote according to D21 out of the people uh, that, that were uh, on the first two places of each party. So here are some results. 34% of people use all four votes, all four that they had. Very, that's, that's, that was a very good results for us because they are indeed people did vote outside their political party despite the fact that they, they knew nothing about D21 until then. They, was just, they saw it for the first time in their life. Um, we can see uh, some other statistics, but here on the right-hand side, uh, very interesting uh, statistics again. Only 26 people voted for their party and nobody else. Uh, and 30% of people voted for their party and another one. Uh, and actually, if you sum up the numbers, um, over 50, uh, over 60 percent of people voted outside of their party. Okay, so people had the candidates. They had four votes. They had a list of first two candidates from each political party, and uh, over 60 percent voted outside of their political party. Now, one very funny number that did surprise me, and it is the 9.6 percent. So, what in the only different parties? So, what happened is that almost 10 percent of people when they had the list of candidates, they voted for candidates uh, that were outside the party uh, that they chose. So exit polls, people were filling questions, they said, what party did you vote for? They would uh, say that uh, they vote, for example, ODS. But then they were offered the candidates, including the first two candidates of ODS. They, uh, they chose only people outside the party. Why is that? That's quite interesting, it's 10%, so it's a non-negligible number. The reason for that is that we looked into more details is that really people were thinking about the persons. So there was a case of, for example, one politician who was a candidate of a, a quite popular party in the Czech Republic, but he was very controversial. He was kind of known to be corrupt, or at least it was assumed about him, and people didn't like him. So even the voters, the supporters of the party X, did not like uh, this guy and did not vote for him or even for the second place. So a very interesting situation. Again, shows that uh, people are engaged and people are relatively smart from what we could expect. Um, and now, Democracy 21, extremely important, most important for politics. Um, 
and that will bring the change. However, how should we implement D21? How can we force politicians to make a change? In, the che in Czech, we have a proverb. We have the proverb that the carbs do not... Um, Do not want to, thank you, do not want to drain their pond. Uh, and indeed, politicians do not want to make changes which are not in their favor, where most of them are in the political process uh, for, let's say, uh, subjective or selfish reasons. But fortunately, it turned out, and it turned out a little bit later, uh, in the year 2040, I was presenting D21 in uh, Washington DC and New York City. And uh, when I was presenting to representative of, uh, of the World Bank, one of them suggested that this is an interesting system that could be applied, that could be used in uh, other things, like, for example, participatory budgeting, as we, uh, as we uh, heard uh, in previous uh, talk uh, by Tanya. And, um, the, uh, and indeed, when I heard it for the first time, uh, it, I did not expect that it would be the, the right way because uh, the politics was the important. But at the same time, I was open. I said, okay, if it should help, let's try and let's do it. And fortunately, not only that it works, but it works greatly. Uh, and uh, it turns out uh, that we have developed a business around that, a business that involves uh, participatory budgeting. Uh, and also, also um, and, uh, we are offering uh, voting for communities, uh, of course, uh, non-profit uh, service. The applications can be in business. If you imagine large corporations, you can get uh, communication between management and employees in a much better way, a much better engagement of people. You can learn many more things. So... Um, the example is uh, our, uh, our primary, I would say, our diamond example is the uh, city Ričany in the Czech Republic, a city of uh, 15,000 residents, 11,000 voters, uh, where uh, they, we, we um, created with them a uh, um, process called Řídím Ričany, meaning I manage Ričany. Uh, that's, a, that's a process which has lasted for uh, since 2014 now. And uh, it is part of it, big part of it is a participation process. Uh, you have heard about it from uh, Tanya a moment ago. Uh, let me just say how here it's being done. Technologically very advanced way. So people need to once their the ID or passport and go and register. And once they register, they receive their unique number. And for the future, they, uh, they, are, they have unique identification. And whenever there is a decision being made, uh, participatory budget voting or any other voting, they just get an invitation. They can use their number and vote from their mobile and from uh, their computer. Very easy, uh, very easy process, very motivating. People like it. People have the multiple votes. It is we are applying Democracy 21 with many votes for and also votes against. And uh, you can see now we have over 1,600 registered voters, which is 15% uh, uh, of the no uh, total number of voters. So uh, there's, um, our colleagues said uh, like the 6% participation. Here we are at 15% participation. So, and uh, we have great experience with that. And really uh, the, the process works uh, like as an, in, in, I would say, highway on information, communication between, uh, between uh, city council and the people. Indeed, of course, uh, the activity is not just voting. The activity is that people make proposals. The proposals are being, um, are being um, worked on or are, are being, uh, um, reviewed uh, by expert committee and those who, who, are, uh, how, uh, who are good are going bad and then people voted, voted in again. Uh, voting, participatory budgeting uh, done by uh, uh, Democracy 21 is, is not just in the Czech Republic where it is over 30 cities already, but we are already in quite a few countries in the world. We are in three countries in Africa, including for example Tunisia and Zambia. Uh, France, Scotland, uh, and more. And uh, our another great example is New York City. 
The participatory budgeting uh, of New York City is done by Democracy 21. We have done that first time in 2016. Uh, and as you can see, as we are implementing our technology and cooperating better and better with the city, uh, the participation has been increasing and also the online voting, the flexible uh, voting uh, has been greatly increasing as well. And we are expecting uh, further additional improvement for next year. Let me now... Um, um, go uh, to uh, non-business application of D21. I have talked about uh, participant budgeting and others, which is, which is a great business. We have also now voting in schools and more. But uh, last year, uh, I got the idea of social game, of something that we can engage people actively into uh, showing what they really want into participating, into evaluating, in this case that will follow, into voting, evaluating, searching for a Czech president. So this is, this is a, a social game, that, a, a civic game that started on the 21st of December at 1221, it's called President 21, and it is something that people search, vote, for a Czech president using Democracy 21, so a much better voting tool uh, used as a social game. Now for that, we uh, can see our partners um, uh, that we have uh, cooperated with. Uh, this, this voting has been done especially with cooperation of uh, University of Cambridge and also uh, Czech, uh, Czech uh, University in Brno. Uh, so, uh, what we are, so what we are uh, doing here, so President 21 is a voting game where each person can nominate a candidate. So anybody can be nominated, anybody who satisfies the legal requirements, being a Czech citizen over 40 years old. And every person, every voter has three, uh, has, uh, three um, uh, votes, has three votes for. So there is only one winner, but you have three votes. Uh, this is interesting, not two, but even three. And there are some reasons for that why uh, we decided to choose three votes and one vote against. And the goal is, again, to find and uh, to show preferences, to show what really people want and who would be the winner if a, a transparent, good and fair voting system was used, not the, not the standard one. So here are some results. Uh, as of now, we have already 160, uh, one and five sixes uh, around this number, Czech citizens participating in, in, this, uh, in this civic responsible game. Uh, for your information, it is uh, around 2.4% uh, of voters in the Czech Republic, which is around 7 million. And this is after a few months. Without too much intense marketing, we are preparing much intense marketing in the fall. Uh, our ambition, our ambition is to reach 660s. 666666 of people participating, which would be uh, around 9.6% of voters in the Czech Republic. Now, what is the goal of this game? The goal of this game is indeed to find a Czech president and to help the winner to argue that he or she, in this case probably he, is the representative person who will be representative president, who will be a, a guy who will, um, who will um, lead the country towards, uh, towards more values and he, who will be um, an um, example uh, for others. Uh, and assuming that game is successful, assuming that we have many voters, uh, the candidate, the winner, will be able to use the game as an argument to say, uh, people, you can look, if a transparent, good and fair voting system were to be used, I would be the winner. So this person can unite uh, people and can actually win. It can be a major factor for, for the winner. Here are the results for your information. Uh, so we have, every voter has three plus votes. You can vote up to three people and one vote against. So here is uh, the order according to the sum of the votes. The first person is Jiří Drahoš, is a professor uh, who was uh, the leader, the president of the Czech Academy of Sciences until, until last year, until end of last year. 
He is now a big winner in this game. Over here, you cannot see it, but almost 51,000 voters uh, in, in the game. What is also important, however, that uh, Yuri Drahosh uh, is not controversial at all. He has the sum of his votes is 51,000, and by plus votes, he has 52,000 plus votes. So he has only 1,000 votes against. Okay? The second is another candidate, 31,000 votes, but he has, uh, his plus votes are 41,000, so he is already very controversial. 10,000 people vote against him. So this is the information that we are getting. Who is a consensual candidate? Now, um, our current president, you might know the name, Miloš Zeman. Uh, I don't want to go into uh, details uh, concerning his personality, but nevertheless, the data are clear. Uh, this person has 35, uh, 30, almost 37,000 votes for, so yes, we are engaging people all from all spectrum of the society, including uh, lower uh, social classes, etc. even voters for Zeman. But he is also absolutely the first one, if you look at the rank by minus one, he has almost 60,000 votes against. So in the total sum, Miloš Zeman, our current president, is minus 24,000 votes. So he's, a, he's a big, uh, big uh, ahead uh, at the back. Um, now, um, we are trying to make this uh, game uh, inclusive, many, many people, inclusive all societies. I have invested a lot of money in the whole process of D21 and also in the game of President 21. And what we also, because we need to participate people from low caste, in fact, uh, uh, we have designed another uh, interesting feature. And the feature is academic, uh, academic questionnaire, which was created uh, in cooperation with Cambridge University and the Masaryk University of Brno. And this academic questionnaire is that people after voting, they can fill, they, are, they have the option to full, fill up a questionnaire, sophisticated questionnaire, which gives us data, sociological data uh, or uh, demographic data about, about the birth, uh, person. And in order to motivate people, they can win. So you or Czech citizen can win money by filling up the questionnaire. And what does it mean? Well, this means that we have also uh, great representative uh, samples. Much better than uh, standard polls. Well, what happens if you are polling people? Well, a significant uh, portion of, a uh, significant number of people refuses to fill in, uh, to participate in surveys. And this creates big systematic biases. And of course, it depends on the case, how big the bias is. Here, we are having uh, people who fill in the questionnaires, so we know the exact social-democratic structure. Of course, we have more people who are, um, who are in the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, lower percentage of voters of Zeman, higher percentage of people uh, for voting for somebody else, but it doesn't matter, because we have the demographic data, and so can select a sample. And uh, why, is it, uh, why is it a very good representative sample? Well, sure, there is a theoretical bias, because it is conditional. Our, uh, our sample is conditional on those people who went to play the game. But this bias for many, I would say most, uh, maybe almost all, uh, questions that we are interested in is, uh, is not a bias, because it's really uncorrelated. How do you, let's say you have a person from this village here uh, who, has, uh, who has this uh, job, etc., his level of income, and um, so what, what is the systematic bias between two people with the same demographic structure, one of them uh, going to vote the game and the other one not? Well, of course, it depends on the question. If we ask uh, if uh, the person uh, uh, spends time on the computer, there is a bias. But for, for, the, uh, for the questions that we, are, uh, that we are asking, it can be very well reasonably assumed uh, that there will be very, very little, if uh, maybe perhaps no bias. So this is something that, uh, that, uh, we, uh, that show us very promising results because we are getting an information, sociological information, which is extremely valuable and which has never been done, from what I can say, has never been done by, by any uh, agency, any um, means.
So the thing about the game, right? We talk about um, when we talk about democracy, we talk about politics, we talk about decisions being made in the highest ranks of government. And what we're talking about is a game. Now, what consequences does a game have, right? You may ask. So the thing about being a game has its point of purpose. So if your voting participation is low, if the morale is low, if there's demoralization of the hefty bureaucratic structures, a game is easy, it's accessible, it's light, and it stimulates debate. It stimulates the desire to research your candidates, to participate, it gives a sense of empowerment. Yes, it does not have a direct impact on who gets voted for. It is a game, it has no political power, so to speak. And yet it does, because it stimulates debate because it simulates participation, because it provides a legitimate set of evidence for whoever wins in the game to say, look, you know, this is what I have scored with these people. I have legitimate grounds. I have legitimate grounds to candidate. It is a way of re-engaging people in the process. And of course, the final aim is to really engage people enough so that they go to the actual elections and vote for their real preferred candidate. I guess it's a way of inspiring hope back into the democratic electoral process, which in our country has been very grievously undermined in the last decade or so. And actually, most people's responses in surveys on the streets are very highly negative in terms of what they think about the democratic process, about the democratic decision making process in our country. So, re engaging interest, inspiring morale, making it easy and accessible. Most people have a phone, most people have a computer, you don't have to go anywhere. It is not complicated, it is fun. You can nominate your cousin. You know, you can make the whole thing into a bit of a joke, and yet, at the same time, whilst being a joke, whilst being light, whilst soaking over over beer, you're going to start thinking. You're going to start looking at the other candidates, their mandates. What do they stand for? And of course, I mean, there is a selection of people who probably, well, who have not confirmed their candidacy, so who won't are. There's also a good selection of people who have confirmed their candidacy and who are planning to run in the real election. Now, we live in a world where most people use apps, right? You probably all have an app. I don't know, Uber, Facebook Messenger, something. Facebook, right? Most of you have Facebook. So how to create an app which will re-engage civic interest in the democratic process? An app that is fun, that is easy to use, but at the same time relates directly to what happens in the real world. Now, an app has more than just these advantages. There are things like being anonymous, there are things like it being unbiased. So in the previous example, from what I gathered in the previous school, most of it was managed by the government, analyzed by the government. So again, we have an entity which manages, analyzes, has power, has control, and in certain structures, we may question the motivations of those who are there for analyzing data. How can we make this process, and we can make this process, using modern technology, independent within the realms of possibility of possible control and manipulation? by entrusting it to a completely unbiased third party. So all of these potential advantages can be attached to it being a simple game. So of course we are aware of the limitations, but at the same time we feel that within the constraints of the current political climate, it could result in very real re-engagement, which could have very real results in the actual vote. And uh, yes, it's the technologies that we have. In the previous game, in the present Ventiva game, it is us, my team, we have control of the data. And of course, somebody could accuse us that we want to manipulate something that we can have interest, some interest, etc. Well, of course, uh, we don't. But uh, we cannot generalize this for, uh, for everybody because it could be biased. But we have this absolutely fabulous technologies nowadays, uh, type of blockchain technologies. What does it mean? We can have totally unbiased, decentralized computation and power, open source. So what can happen as soon as there is a problem in society, anybody can uh, open source, run open source game, which is in the cloud, which is there, and either people want to participate or not, but nobody can erase it. So if we run a game, evaluate our government, and people want to go and they want to play the game, all the politicians can just look at it and they cannot do anything about it. So this is the uh, amazing technology, decentralized computing power, absolute objectivity that we can have. Now, uh, of course, there is an assumption here. The assumption is that people do have free access to the internet, free access to technology. 
So it, this still wouldn't work for like North Korea, but it already does work for many countries that have problems and we can push the justice, if not democracy process, uh, much better or not even push, but inspire and uh, motivate people. There is another important feature. Using the technology of private keys, uh, we can now, and it's not widespread, but it's a matter of years, every person can have his or her private key. So you can access the system. So what we can guarantee? Let's say that we want to evaluate a certain company, a society, or a country. And we can say only those people who are citizens of the country or participants or employees of the company can participate. So you can do that uh, using the private key technology that people can, only those people who are eligible, who are the stakeholders, can participate. And at the same time, they participate uh, anonymously, in principle, anonymous, anonymously, in principle. Okay? It's not exact, but uh, in principle, yes. So, so this is a powerful tool. And this powerful tool brings us, offers us even new type of games. And uh, in, uh, very shortly, I would like to describe a very important new type of game, which we call Referendum 21. Referendum is, uh, could be very problematic, it's risky as we can see, it's uh, subject to manipulation. But what is the problem of standard referendum? It's a binary choice. Everybody force either yes or no. It is uh, splitting society, putting people against each other. What is referendum 21? It is a game, a questionnaire game where people say, but they do not just say yes or no, but there must be at the minimum three choices. Definitely no, rather no, and yes. Better, we might have five choices. Definitely no, rather no, neutral, yes, or rather yes, or definitely yes. And these people can evaluate uh, in this game using, uh, in this way, using uh, uh, evaluate anything. And yes, we can run these games on, again, on different communities, on firms, on cities. We can run such a game to evaluate governments, how satisfied people are with the president, or we can uh, start this game, anybody can start this game, open source, totally objective, evaluating any country. For example. So, first, we were talking about democracy the whole time. Um, now, the acts do not need to be limited to a system which runs on a technical, democratic, electoral basis. So, K21, here you have a picture of Bhutan, the Kingdom of Bhutan in the Himalayas. Yeah. And yes, this is a constitutional democracy. So has a very strong monarchy. However, at the same time, we believe very strongly that there is a possibility that the Kingdom of Bhutan will be seriously interested in implementing some of these applications in their decision-making process. So we believe that by creating the possibility of people to come together in a virtual space and gather around issues, social issues, political issues, economic issues that they may be troubled by, for starters, it provides a focal point. So people from the very western province of Bhutan, who would have never met anyone from the eastern province, can gather and realize that they have a similar issue and find out about each other's existence from a point of potential previous isolation and gather together. The other thing, of course, is that by providing a data feed, which is freely available to both people and those in government, we are therefore offering the possibility for people, yes, to gather, but also for the government to have data to evaluate and to potentially respond to. The government of Bhutan does a lot of its own surveys. The technology is not quite as advanced. And they do react to their surveys. So the GNH Commission gathers data and reacts to that data. So we believe if they have better data, they could react better. But the great thing, of course, is that even if the government does not react, these games can still run. They are independent of whether the government is for or against these initiatives, and they provide a basis for people to communicate and provide an example of a more democratic decision-making process, as we can see in places where the government may not support such initiatives. So fortunately, uh, again, the games are independent of the approval of the king or a party or whoever. And uh, we can, uh, so if, for example, uh, there, is, there is a monarchy which is despotic, uh, and people run this game and we can see that 38.2% people say definitely know that they are unhappy. It is an objective data. It is an objective data which can allow international community uh, to put pressure objectively, not just different opinions. Really, we have a mirror of the reality. 
21, a system, uh, not necessarily a democracy, but a ruling party, ruling oligarchy. Again, we can have a system which works reasonably well, and, we, and uh, the system might have the anchor, democratic anchor, that people can evaluate the game. Now, uh, China is an ex interesting example. Well, I was hoping that China could be uh, interested in communicating these technologies. Unfortunately, it turned out that actually I became a personal non grata in China. I was refused visa when I was supposed to go there for a conference in physics, a uh, conference in theoretical physics, where I was actually also would be talking about uh, these tools uh, to use for communication. But they refused my visa. So, uh, But nevertheless, we can run a so social game uh, uh, objective social game on China as well. And uh, yes, again, we will uh, get a mirror that reflects uh, the, society, uh, the, the reality. And yes, the next level is Democracy 21. A great tool. Uh, I don't have much time here because we, need to, we are running out of time. Uh, but we have heard about D21 a lot. But it is not necessary just about parliamentary elections. We can go further. We can go more towards direct democracy with referendums 21 and other, other communication. We can have people communicating uh, across, uh, across the whole nation or even across the whole world. And here is, here is the vision. Well, we... Uh, we uh, we went through a complicated evolution. Life was created uh, based on water, H2O, H20, as an essential molecule for creating life. And we have come through a complicated evolution, very difficult one, a lot of, a lot of uh, badness happening, a lot of suffering, but also a lot of great. And all this suffering and badness was there to force us to evolve, to come to the point where we are, where we have now the science, when we, when we know so much, when we can look to the nearest uh, sub-particle, sub particle, at the same time look at the whole universe as a, as a whole. And um, so I really believe that now we are in the process where we need to do the flip, the change, and, uh, and come uh, to a situation where people uh, connect their knowledge, their brains, using technologies and uh, create like a global scope, uh, like uh, we can imagine as a picture that we as humans could be like uh, uh, neurons of, of a big global brain. Uh, that includes technology, that also includes artificial intelligence. That's, uh, and maybe, maybe it's already, maybe all this work is not that necessary anymore. Maybe artificial intelligence will save us, I don't know. But we still uh, need to uh, take our responsibility. Well, exactly. Just on the off chance that Dr. Janicek may be wrong and robots are not going to come and save our democratic process, we can start by perhaps refining it ourselves and using the tools that are available to us, thanks to the technology that is now available, the huge quantum leap that has been done by humanity in the last hundreds of years, to try and improve our process, how we should make decisions, to try and improve our society, and to go back to where I started my introduction, which is what are we really about? What are we aiming for? What is important? And how can we make it happen? So that we can feel proud for the world that we leave for our children. I'd like to thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. to invite you uh, to read an uh, academic paper that I wrote towards this topic in more detail. It's on, uh, if you go d21.me on the web page and you read more explanation and you, you get a PDF document, that's it. And there I explain, I do some comparison to other voting system. I, and one can really argue, see uh, why D21 is, uh, is so much up front, why it's really from those two windows. Now, of course, you are right. Arrow impossibility theorem says uh, the impossible of so-called 
unlikely voting system, but there actually I argue that the axioms of arrow impossibility theorem are not perhaps uh, not so good. The, the, the independence uh, of irrelevant alternatives is maybe not a good axiom. Yeah, it can it can be shown there, but nevertheless, of course, there must be and there could be weaknesses. For D21, it is much more difficult to construct one because there is because you have the two seat voting district, you have the four vote, more votes, so you really need to be searching. What you can construct, okay, you can find a situation where a person who is the fourth choice of more people can win, even though uh, such a person might be fourth choice of, uh, of some people and might be disliked by many others. Okay, another person who would be the first choice of a little bit or one person less uh, might not win because of that uh, feature. But those are very artificial examples. Yeah? So in principle, in, in, in the standard process, it is really hard to construct. Uh, unlike standard voting system, uh, the type of first pass, or even to run voting system, if you look at French elections, presidential elections, well, the difference in the first round from 23% to 19 point something, there was a great risk, and many, and I uh, actually I know some French people, many people are really afraid that Le Pen makes it into second round with the extreme leftists, which would be a catastrophe. Yeah, and it could have easily happened. There was a statistical error in there. So this is something, so this shows that the two-run voting system uh, is not, doesn't save it, not just the first past the post. But D21 in, in this case, uh, yes. I do not, uh, well, uh, I do have experience with that, and we do have uh, people who are voting in the Czech Republic who are really honest people and who would never get corrupt. And there, there, is, there is a significant percentage of them, even in the current system, which is, which is rotten, which is pro-corrupt, given the close and party list. If you take the logic of D21, once it needs to be implemented, because uh, the, here uh, the, uh, uh, also the motivation is that people use it, they use it for PB processes, etc., and they want it, they want it for elections, so politicians will have no choice. They will have to offer the change. But now, in order for the political party to be strong, it will need to offer two people in each voting district who have a chance, not give a close and party list, put corruptors in there, and just, uh, just get some percentage. But they will really need to choose someone. So, uh, on average, the quality of the people, the moral quality will be much higher. And now, if you look at the process, imagine now that you have a parliament where it is standard, nowadays to corrupt. Now you have a new parliament where it is standard not to corrupt. So you, you have, uh, first of all, uh, you will have uh, from the uh, probability distribution of people, if you measure it, for example, from, uh, from uh, ethics or from a moral value of people, you will make not the bad choice, which is the current voting system, but the good one. And now uh, the people who are uh, in the parliament, now it will be normal not to steal. And we can see that happen it's, it's happening in the world. In northern countries, there are places which have no corruption, almost no corruption. So, so when it becomes the norm, then it will happen. Yeah? So because there is, there is, of course, there are people who would never go corrupt. There are people who would always uh, be corrupt. But there is a big uh, line of people who are following the crowd, so to say. And uh, so, so this change, uh, yeah, I believe, will solve uh, or help to solve corruption a lot. Yes, I have, I have three remarks to make. Uh, now, the, the first one is more or less in, in continuation of what has been said before about Arrow's theorem. Now, it's not that much about impossibility. It's about axiomatization. No? Any voting procedure is axiomatizable, even if you have negative votes, and actually exist axiomatizations for procedures that include negative votes. So when you present a, a, a procedure like that, uh, I would expect to know what are the bad properties, which surely exist. I mean, surely your method has positive properties and surely has negative properties, and they are known. So I would expect to tell us what are the things that don't work. That's okay. the first remark. The second remark is about power distribution. When you create a voting system, no? which is applied in electing uh, or whatever approving, you generate a system of power distribution, no? which is measured through coalition theory. No? So once again, I would expect to know when you suggest a way to distribute power, how this 
distributes power and with what properties. The last thing is that about corruption and about, no, there is no historical evidence that the voting system has ever been correlated with the political situation in the country, in any country around the world. No? So you can use whatever electoral system you want, there will be countries more or less corrupted for reasons that have nothing to do with the electoral system. No? So why I should mm. accept a correlation between the electoral system and uh, the voting system? There is no historical evidence about it. I don't know what I asked from the back, and maybe if you could repeat the questions after, because I might not be able to recall it. But uh, let me tell uh, to, to I don't know what historical events, what data you are arguing about. Uh, nevertheless, I know uh, I was involved with anti-corruption men fighting against corruption. I became in contact, in communication with members of parliament, and I could see there where the, that's why I said where the problem is. Because those people, they do not want to change. So it's throwing, like uh, we say, peace against the wall. You cannot do anything. Because even if you have rational, reasonable argument, which is undoubtedly correct uh, from legislative point of view, because we were also pressing for changes in legis leg legislation, more transparency, if they do not want it, it just doesn't happen. So now, uh, imagine a close and party list where everybody uh, has only one vote for one party. Often people vote for lesser evil. The political parties do not care. They, they put corruptors in the party list. And the voters cannot do anything about that. That's a fact. On the other side, if we want to have a practical example, we have a Senate in the Czech Republic upper house, which is a two-run system. It's a majority system, one seat voting district, but the quality is already much better. The two-run voting system in Senate is already much less corruption than the, than the, uh, than the parliament. And this, those are facts from the Czech Republic, and they are logical and they are happening. So, uh, so there are many people in Senate who are actually fighting corruption, who are cooperating on these processes. So, so uh, this is a direct proof that just a change uh, like that changes the, the, the corruption potential. And yet, uh, the two-run voting system is much worse from all the logical reasons that we have said than D21. So, so really, I mean, uh, there is something that um, I, uh, I uh, guarantee there is, uh, that this, 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 the change in corruption will, will, be, will be huge. It's, it's, I mean, it's even natural. Imagine you have the probability distribution, as I was describing, of the uh, people measured by morality, let's say other things being equal, expertise and uh, identity. And now, uh, now you, have a, you have this system uh, which motivates only people from the negative spectrum to participate. In the, in the Czech Republic, uh, many people who would be otherwise willing to take responsibility for social matters and they would like to do some candidacy, they just don't do it because they do not want to go into the corrupt mess. Some of them do, but very few. I, am, I know many people who argue, yes, this is this. If the system was better, if they had a chance, they would try and they would go for it if they saw that, that it makes sense. So as soon as you give, uh, say you give them the chance, the opportunity, it will change. So that was the last question. And I already don't remember the, f oh, the f uh, okay. If I may react to your last question, as a social scientist, it's not merely about the procedural way in which elect our representatives that we're trying to work on, which I think is the really important key point. And I'm sure you will agree that, yes, of course, we can have a democratic a procedural democracy in an African country, which will help to elect and sustain effectively a dictatorial government. And that democracy does not guarantee liberalism. It does not guarantee an active civil society. However, the very essence of the process, the reason why we're doing games and we're not supporting someone's electoral campaign is because the key is to foster civil society is to foster a civic engagement. And I'm sure you will agree that to some extent, these things will have a certain coloration in general with the degree in which there is a, to which there is a tendency for politicians to then be able to engage in corruption. So it's not merely the procedures that we're interested in. We are interested in stimulating the field of engagement, which is actually, in my opinion, the most interesting about the whole process. And if I may react to your first two questions, they are very complex. I don't think we have the time, but we do have resources online that do react to it in great detail, and I shall pass the mic back to Dr. Janacek. Uh, I can, uh, of course, it's, it's very, there will be very long discussion, which we probably don't have much time for that. We can engage afterwards. Let me just make one point. Uh, the weaknesses of D21. Uh, 
D21 has evolved originally as a vote against against corruption, and then uh, it was the the previous version. And then the Democracy 21 is the effect of multiple votes as the most important. It is great to include also the vote against the minus vote uh, as a tool, especially in corrupt countries like Czech Republic. There is a weakness in here. You cannot use these in general. So, for example, if you have uh, some kind of religious minorities it might be a problem to use a vote against, okay? So, so if you implant D21 with, vote, with a minus vote, that must be carefully considered. Depends on the situation in each country. In relatively uniform demography, uh, like Czech Republic or Europe in general, it, it can be uh, not necessary elsewhere. Concerning D21, uh, now, without the minus vote, for the sake of argument, with the effect of multiple votes, please try to find uh, weaknesses. I already mentioned one here. Of course, you can construct a situation where a candidate who is the fourth for a significant number of people and not favored by others beats a candidate who would be the first choice for n minus one people. And n people for the fourth choice, n minus one for the first choice, and the n, uh, n people might win. But those are very artificial examples where the like kind of the distribution of preference would be extremely, uh, uh, extremely pointed, like direct, uh, pointed to, uh, to one point, very unnatural. Okay, unfortunately we should finish because our next speaker should, uh, uh, will go to the airplane, so we should have our next talk in 1.50. So please come here after the lunch in one.